Uh, my name is Roseanne Bacha Garza. I am the CHAPS program manager at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. I also teach history. I teach the basic history survey classes there. And CHAPS is an acronym for Community Historical Archaeology Project with Schools. Uh, in a nutshell, our group, which is a consortium of uh, various different professors from uh, different academic di disciplines at the university, uh, which include history, anthropology, archaeology, geology, biology, uh, educational psychology, education, public administration, marketing, <laughs> entrepreneurialism. <laughs> You know, we kind of keep it, um, we're, we're um, how would I say this, very humble in the way that uh, we don't feel we know everything and we would like to open it up to everybody to participate because when it, it's a true community effort, um, we have found that we've gotten wonderful results. And so, um, this um, Rio Grande Valley Civil War Trail project is a true community uh, grassroots effort and um, and with part of that acronym being uh, projects with schools we also develop curriculum and lesson plans for K through 12 education in addition to teaching classes at the university so we kind of feel ourselves <laughs> as P through 17 if you will uh, with regard to uh, what type of students we uh, hope to inspire in the community so um, uh, that's what CHAPS is in a nutshell uh, in an, uh, with most of our efforts going toward um, preserving the uh, rich and valuable history of the Rio Grande Valley and bringing it to the attention to the community at large so that everybody, whether you were born and raised here or you are visitors like uh, Winter Texans perhaps we have in the room, I imagine, um, and, uh, or recent transplants. Um, I've been living here since 2005, so I'm, I am a transplant, but I'm not a recent transplant. I've been here almost 15 years, um, and so I enjoy living down here. I've met a lot of nice and uh, wonderful people here. I do see some familiar faces in the audience, Mike for one. Uh, so welcome, welcome to the program. Um, next. So, like I said, we at the CHAPS program are a consortium of uh, different professors as well as uh, community individuals, community experts we feel uh, who uh, we pull in to assist us with certain projects. So with regard to the Rio Grande Valley Civil War Trail, um, we've passed out our uh, tourism brochure maps to everybody. If you haven't gotten one, please pick one up on the way out. Uh, and so um, this project uh, has been our baby since about 2013. We launched it in 2015 with the, um, uh, coinciding with the sesquicentennial observation of the end of the U.S. Civil War. And so uh, that was not enough for us. We wanted to uh, pound the pavement a little bit more and develop more products and uh, more, his, uh, more uh, items of historical significance. And one of them being this <clears throat> War and Peace on the Rio Grande, 1861 to 1867. I'm sorry when I sent the, the bio and the description, I transposed uh, 1867 to be 1876. So technically, <laughs> Um, 1861 was the beginning of the Civil War, 1865 was the end of the Civil War, but we bring it out to 1867 for this particular part of the project uh, because there was still acti activity going on down here, uh, particularly with reconstruction, reconstructing the, um, the forts, the military forts along the Rio Grande through 1867 and then beyond. Um, so with this museum project, this traveling museum exhibit that we've launched on uh, February 4th 
uh, just about a month ago. Um, the folks in the pictures are um, fellow professors at UTRGV. I happen to have their pictures because they're already on our website. So we have Dr. Irving Levinson, uh, Dr. Christopher Miller, Russell Skoranek, and Chuck Waite, and then myself. Uh, those are the um, UTRGV um, professors that are working on this uh, war and peace in the, in the Rio Grande Valley Civil War Trail project. Uh, and then we, like I said, we don't feel like we know everything or can do everything. We need help. We always ask for help. And the good news is, is we have good friends in the community who are often willing to help us. So uh, from the National Park Service over at Palo Alto uh, Battlefield National Historic Park, we have uh, Doug Murphy. Uh, who is, was instrumental in developing their museum exhibit over there, and then has assisted um, uh, Dr. Miller, Dr. Skoranek, and Dr. Waite in developing our Fort Brown exhibit with a class full of students that we did about a year and a half ago. Um, and then Karen and Tom Fort uh, who are major historians in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, Karen has written several books, uh, one in which is called Cotton Bales and Cannonballs. I think it has to do with the cotton trade industry during the Civil War down here on the Rio Grande. Uh, and then her husband, Tom Fort, is the senior historian at the Museum of South Texas History. And clearly, with a lot of experience developing museum exhibits. So with this team, we uh, worked about two years developing, uh, initiating, designing, developing, and then actually producing this exhibit. So go ahead, next. Um, so one of you at least mentioned that you saw me and uh, my other two colleagues on the Con Mi Gente did anybody else see that? A couple of you? Okay, so Rick Diaz came, um, you know, some <coughs> news and excitement was generated, it has been generated on this, on this project, so we were very fortunate to have Rick Diaz come and visit us at the exhibit. And he talked to us <laughs> and spent about a good hour with us uh, getting to know the exhibit and then interviewing us individually in front of our particular areas of expertise. So um, um, that was a, a very nice plug for our, um, our traveling exhibit. And uh, before I leave, let me tell you where the exhibit is traveling to. But let me start with, I'm going to go over, not in great detail because clearly I want you to go visit the exhibit. Okay, so I'm not going to go over the panels in detail, um, but I'm going to tell you how we designed the exhibit and um, maybe just a little tidbit of information uh, to get your curiosity piqued. So um, we designed this exhibit uh, in a series of triptych panels. So. Um, Although all of the sets are not in sets of three, the introduction panel are, panels are in a set of two, and then the exit panel is just one. But the five main core subject matters that we cover in this exhibit are set up in a uh, panel, a, a triptych panel or a three panel set. So uh, we have on the introduction panel the title of our exhibit and uh, a little bit about what life was like down here in the Rio Grande Valley just prior to the Civil War. We talk about Brownsville, we talk about uh, different folks who were here and um, you know succeeding very well in business down here and uh, we talk about you know the landscape and and the ranching industry and whatnot so um, we go over that within the introduction panels. Next. <coughs> so uh, this is our regional enterprise and or uh, trade and commerce section. Uh, we have, um, this is where Karen and Tom Fort were very key and instrumental in assisting us with this particular subject matter. And uh, so what we 
what we have here is white gold, and that doesn't only mean cotton, it means salt from Sol Del Rey. So if any of you have um, been down here for quite a bit and been able to take a trip up to uh, northern Hidalgo County to see La Sol Del Rey, um, that's wonderful. If you haven't, you should. Um, it's, it's a very wonderful natural resource down here, and it's, it's been um, a location of extreme value for um, thousands of years, you know, going back to when we had the Native American peoples of uh, this region roaming and, um, and, and living. So uh, we talk about um, the river in this, in this particular set of triptych panels. We talk about the white gold and the, uh, and the transportation thereof of, of such items. And we talk about the entrepreneurs. Uh, so we, we talk about uh, the different business people who were um, taking advantage of these um, trade opportunities. And you know we, um, um, we call them entrepreneurs. Some people might call them um, war profiteers or something else that might not be uh, so kind, but we're not, that's not our business. Um, you know, we, we do uh, highlight these people on our, on our trail and in the books that we've written. Uh, and, you know, they are, um, they were and some still are very instrumental in the economics of the region. Next. Um, and with regard to the trade of cotton and salt and those uh, businesses that were happening down here, uh, what we believe is that had the Union, had the North been able to successfully blockade the trade of Confederate cotton uh, along the Rio Grande, uh, there would have been uh, maybe uh, one for sure, maybe two years le less that the U.S. Civil War had persisted. So what we say here is that um, the Rio Grande was at that time the natural boundary between the United States and Mexico. Therefore, it was an international boundary between two countries and therefore considered neutral territory. Richard King, uh, Mifflin Kennedy, Charles Stillman, those who owned riverboat companies or steamboat companies or ships that were going up and down the Rio Grande filled with cotton uh, to get out to uh, Baghdad and then to the out to the uh, out into the Rio Grande where thousands of ships were waiting to purchase these items. Um, those folks were able to transport these goods along the Rio Grande by flying Mexican flags on those ships along the Rio Grande. Therefore, the United States government or the Union could not board those ships or could not blockade that. That would have been considered an act of war. So the success of the cotton trade and, and other white gold like, um, like salt, and then also they were, uh, which was allowing the Confederacy to purchase arms, ammunition, other war material, um, medicine and things that could help their cause continue to roll throughout the Civil War. Um, the sale of those items and the business that was happening along the Rio Grande during that period of time allowed the Confederacy to continue on as long as, it, as they did. So if the US or the Union um, forces were able to successfully blockade that trade, the US Civil War would have lasted uh, for less time and less people would have died. So we estimate that um, if, the, if the U.S. Civil War lasted one year less, at least over 100,000 people would not have died. And so here on one of our educational um, tools that we have for the, the, the trunks for the uh, K-12 through education project, 
Um, you know, we show that uh, there were over a million casualties. Uh, technically, I think there was over 600,000 deaths, but when we say casualties, we're talking about injuries that were, you know, uh, whether they were life-threatening or almost life-threatening or <coughs> devastating. Uh, all of those recorded um, injuries and deaths uh, equal over a million people. So by far, this war for the United States uh, was the worst and, and as far as casualties went. But we were, we're stating here that we feel that if the Union was more successful or able to blockade the Confederacy and their trade, uh, it would have lasted less and a lot less people would have, um, would have passed. So concurrent events across the border. I have, I have Dr. Levinson's picture up here because he's the expert, not me. So I could, I could answer certain questions you might have up to a certain extent, but he's the go-to guy that is on our team for anything that was happening in Mexico across the border at the same time. So this triptych panel includes um, information with regard to uh, Republican Mexico and uh, um, and then uh, with the French intervention in Imperial Mexico, if you will. And when I say Republican Mexico, I don't mean like our terms of Republican and Democrat in our political uh, climate here uh, at the moment or in our system. I mean the Republic of Mexico versus Imperial Mexico. Um, so, and then we also talk about transnational complications and we highlight uh, certain characters that were uh, traversing the Rio Grande uh, with great ease, such as uh, Juan Cortina, Colonel John uh, Ford, and um, uh, Santiago Vidaury. So, um, uh, we, uh, we talk about uh, Benito Juarez and, uh, and, and Maximilian and, and uh, Napoleon III in these, in these panels. So um, this is how, and you know, as a, uh, somebody who teaches history at UTRGV, um, I know that a lot of the professors there, when they talk about US history, in the classroom with the students here, they often try to show that what was going on across the border during certain periods of time, whether it's you know modern day periods of time or time back then, um, because it's it's very interesting to see the parallels. Next, military engagements. Uh, in this particular uh, set of panels, we, we definitely highlight that last land battle of the U.S. Civil War. Um, that happened at Palmito Ranch Battlefield just outside of Brownsville. One, a little bit over one month after the surrender of Robert E. Lee to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in early April of 1865. So this battle happened on May 12th and 13th. 1865 and you may think that the reason that battle happened after a whole month after the Confederates had surrendered uh, was because you know back then we don't have we did not have um, the internet we did not have telephone system you know might have telegraph but uh, or that may have been developing but we don't have the media coverage back then that we do today. So news is not instant and immediate. And you may think that, well, you know, they just didn't know the war was over down here. We were kind of off the beaten path and out of the way, and we just didn't know. Well, that's not true. Uh, we did know down here. All of those uh, steamboats that were going up and down the Rio Grande were coming in um, perhaps from Louisiana or other ports along the Gulf with newspapers that they were delivering to different uh, places along, along the Rio Grande. And those newspapers clearly stated that the war was over, that General Lee had surrendered and, and that's it. Well, 
When General Lee surrendered, the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, was not present at that surrender. And Davis was very interested in regrouping. He was not interested in surrendering and giving up. So the word out was that Jefferson Davis was traversing uh, the lower states and on his way to Mexico where he could regroup and then re-enter and start the war again. So the Union forces were on alert, um, looking out for this type of activity. And then in the meantime, at Fort Brown in Brownsville, there was a tremendous amount of cotton um, still being claimed by the Confederacy. And of course, because they were wanting to regroup, they, did, they had something to protect and they did not want to just give it up. So there was a battle on May 12th and 13th, uh, 1865, that occurred at Palmito Ranch or Palmito Hill, depending on which book you read. Uh, has anybody been out to Palmito Ranch and, uh, and driven out Highway 4 toward Boca Chica Beach? Yeah. Now you go out there and uh, you'll, you'll get to see SpaceX. <laughs> but you have to keep going, you know. So... Um, but on Highway 4, on the way out to Boca Chica Beach, so between Brazos Santiago Island and, uh, and Brownsville, this battle ensued. And it was a Confederate victory. Um, however, um, three days before maybe, I want to say it was May the 9th, Jefferson Davis did get apprehended. Uh, I believe he got apprehended in Tennessee. So perhaps that three-day period of time was not enough time to let the Confederates know down here that, okay, now it's really over. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll give them that um, information uh, and assumption. So they most likely did not know that Jefferson Davis was already apprehended. Uh, nonetheless, the war, uh, that battle uh, took place and um, and it was a Confederate victory. So, um, and then the other thing that we also like to talk about was that um, we had a battle down here in April of 1861 that occurred at El Clareño Ranch. Now, if you have our map, uh, Clareño Ranch is on our web, uh, is on our trail. Our trail is a 200 mile trail between um, Laredo to the Gulf, to Boca Chica Beach, and um, um, Clareño Ranch right now is, um, it's not accessible, but if you drive out 83 and as you're going towards Zapata County or in Zapata County already, uh, there is a um, a ranch with a iron gate that says Clareño on it, so at least you'll know you're in the right place. Um, it is private property right now, and um, most of the sites in our, on our trail in Zapata County happen to be under Falcon Lake right now, because after they built the dam and the lake filled up and expanded outward, these sites were then covered up with water. So um, in April of 1861, there was a battle there that um, was <coughs> basically contemporary with the beginning of the U.S. Civil War at Fort Sumter. So we had events occurring down here that were parallel, a uh, running parallel with items that were happening in um, the other more popular or well-known um, states. Who, who was fighting at Corona? Uh, Rip Ford was there, uh, Cortina, and other folks, you know, um, from the Mexican side of the river and then on this side of the river. <coughs> but they had hung Judge Vela um, because he was um, not wanting to, um, even though the United States, or I'm sorry, even though Texas was a Confederate state at the time, he, as the uh, leader of Zapata County at the time, did not want to um, 
concede to the Confederacy. So he was hung and then there was a little battle there and yeah. So, but you know, you can learn more about that when you come to the exhibit. Next. <laughs> okay. Um, Tejanos in the Civil War, you know, where we are right now is on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, we have, um, you know, a very strong Mexican-American heritage here. Uh, and so we have Tejanos who were mustering in to both sides of the U.S. Civil War, interestingly enough, uh, from this immediate region. So uh, we have Tejanos in the Confederacy, Tejanos in the Union Army, and then uh, you know just a general statement about Tejanos and the, the the numbers and how many had mustered in and and whatnot throughout um, throughout the uh, life of the U.S. Civil War. Um, so on the Confederate side, we have the most famous uh, Tejano in the uh, who served in the Confederacy, who was Colonel Santos Benavides out of Laredo. Um, almost able to get himself um, dubbed a general. Uh, he was trying to do that by um, m creating his own, um, his own team, his own unit, which he did, which was um, the 33rd Texas Cavalry or Benavides' regiment. Um, Benavides' regiment did fight at the last battle of the Civil War, although Santos Benavides himself was not there. But his regiment did fight with Rip Ford uh, at the last battle of the Civil War. Um, and so we have a lot of information with regard to Santos Benavides and, and whatnot of those, um, of his unit. Uh, and then on the Union side, we had um, the second, first and second Texas Cavalry that was down here. Uh, and folks were mustering in throughout the um, that period of time. And um, so in particular, what we like to say, uh, or what we like to point out, is that it's, it's very interesting how some of the folks who were residents along the Rio Grande, um, in particular uh, Hidalgo and Starr County, um, well, as well as Cameron County, but the example I'm gonna give you right now has to do with uh, Hidalgo and Starr. Um, the, the soldier all the way to your right is Patricio Perez, and he, he hails out of a, a small little place called Havana. It's a Havana, it's the ranch on the, I think it's the west side of La Jolla, on the way as you're driving. You've, you've seen the little green sign that says Havana. Well, now you know why. It's, it's, this is where this person comes from. It was a, a, a ranch at the time. Um, there are still, if you drive back down toward the old military highway road down there, uh, you'll see a church that's been renovated. You'll see some farmhouses in, in ruins. Um, and I imagine the Rio Grande ran right up to uh, the edge of those properties uh, back then. Um, Patricio Perez mustered into the um, Second Texas Cavalry. He um, uh, for the Union. He mustered in in Brownsville, and um, so he was technically fighting for the North. His brother-in-law was living, or was from Carnesto Landa's ranch in Rio Grande City. His name was Ramon Salinas. He mustered into um, Captain Thomas's company of par or no, he didn't. He mustered into a different Confederate um, um, regiment out of Star County. So here you have relatives living, you know, miles from each other, um, mustering into different sides for whatever reason. So also we have um, another group uh, called Captain Thomas's Company of Partisan Rangers, was also a Confederate unit. It was only working or functional between December of 1862 and March of 1863. So it was a, a short run. 
1862 is when Colonel uh, John Ford got um, a lot of legs with being involved in South Texas in particular in, in fighting in the Civil War. And they were very active in trying to recruit ranchers or vaqueros. They wanted those skilled horsemen to patrol the region. So Captain Thomas's company of partisan rangers did include a lot of ranch owners, uh, in particular from Hidalgo County, that were um, um, landowners. So in the research that I've done with, with this particular unit, I can see when I, when I print out and I look at the list of folks who were in that unit, and then I go to the US Census from 1860, and I find a lot of the names that are on that list were ranch owners at the time. And when you look in the census, you see the name of the person, so you're like, oh, I found a name, isn't that great? But then when you go across and you see the column that says value of land, there's a number in there. Some of them had $500 worth of land, some of them had $2,000 worth of land, but nonetheless they were landowners. And then there's another column that's called, I think it's called possessions. So you'll see another dollar <laughs> value in there. So they had land and they had possessions, which what that meant was they had something to protect. So, you know, it did seem in some cases that brothers were fighting brothers or cousins were fighting bro cousins and whatnot, family members were fighting family members, you know, just like you would see in other, um, in other arenas of the U.S. Civil War in other states and other locations. Um, but here, there weren't as many uh, battles or skirmishes per se, but these folks were mustering in uh, in order to protect their property, to protect their interests. And then um, there's another soldier who mustered into the Confederacy. Um, his name was Abraham Rutledge. And he came from Alabama in a uh, caravan of mixed race families with uh, emancipated slaves, uh, one of which was uh, a woman he was married to and had children with. So you can imagine why would a man married to a half black woman with their own mulatto children muster into the Confederacy. If one of the goals of the Confederate, uh, of the Confederacy was to protect their state's rights and which <coughs> included protecting their right to hold slaves. So it had to be, it looked appealing to that person to want to protect his property. They were promising, and, and the Union was doing the same when they were recruiting people. They were promising them a horse, a saddle, you know, a, a rifle, a, you know, a saber, um, boots, and money to muster in. So, um, you know, it was like, hmm, yes. Were there any local Indians left to get involved? Well, it's interesting you say that. Um, one of the reenactors that we uh, work with a lot is um, a descendant of Lipan Apache. And he says that his ancestor fought in the, uh, in the forces down here out of what we know today of La, Gru La Grulla or Sullivan City, I guess you know where the Low Sebenos Ferry is, somewhere in that region. So whether that person was already kind of assimilated into Tejano culture at the time, but definitely part of that, um, part of that subculture, yes. So, yes? What is the portion, proportion of Anglos and Mexican Americans that fought down here? Well, I, I, would, I would have to say that, you know, there were definitely more Amer um, Mexican Americans or um, Tejanos be just because that's where, you know, we, we did have um, um, 
Well, I could go back into the history of, of the population of this region, uh, but at that time, you'll see, um, like we say that over uh, 4,000 Tejanos mustered into the Confederacy throughout Texas. Uh, and at least 900 Tejanos mustered into the Union Army down here. <coughs> so um, I'll show you in a minute. We have a, a Veterans Memorial Board um, that helps to name uh, the Tejanos that were, were fighting down here. Um, so go ahead. Oh, yes, sir. Did they have slaves here? Not many. No. no. And that's a whole other... I can come back another weekend and talk <laughs> another talk about that. Yes, sir. I, I just point out that we have a picture of Patricia Pettis here on our oh, veteran wall. Excellent. It's been up for many years. Uh -huh. She's also my great great grandfather. Oh. Are you related to Eduardo Vela? Yes. Okay. Because I, I met with him um, not too long ago at, at a at a documentary film debut that we had, so well, nice to meet you. You have to come to our next event, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk I about that in a minute. Very well, like, even since the inception of oh, Chaps. Okay, excellent. So there he is, his great-great-grandfather, Patricio Perez. <laughs> and um, you'll notice here, he, in this picture, he's holding a, uh, a wide-brimmed hat. And, uh, you know, when you think about Civil War folks, you think about this, the kepi or the bummer, that forage cap, that little cap that they, they wore. Um, you know, that was basically used for foraging, like, you know, take the hat off and go find yourself food and carry it back to camp. And, and you know, that's how they gathered food. Well, these folks, you know, where are we? We are in very hot region, very sunny region. And so uh, a lot of those soldiers were wearing the very wide brimmed hats um, so that they could at least keep the sun off them because what they're wearing physically is wool. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I imagine some of you are from the north where, you know, it's <laughs> really cold. Yeah. Here, it's really hot, if you haven't noticed. And, you know, however, those wool coats and those wool pants uh, did protect those soldiers for when they were marching through mesquite brush and, and areas that, you know, would not have, if they had been wearing cotton pants and cotton jackets, they would have been cut up quite, quite a lot. Um, so, and they were, believe it or not, even when it gets wet, they were able to keep themselves um, cool and or warm in certain situations. Um, but here's where I show that, um, you know, Patricio Perez is mustering into the Second Texas Cavalry, and then you have um, uh, Ramon Salinas uh, on the other, uh, on the opposite end there, who had mustered into, oh, he, w he did muster into Captain Thomas's company of partisan rangers. There were a few other um, uh, Confederate units down here as well, and then that Abraham Rutledge as well. So uh, here, that's, uh, that's where we have relatives mustering in to either side, um, and then some of these folks who were technically not quite yet U.S. citizens, uh, but you know, had inherited land and, and were, were living um, on this side of the river, were mustering in because they wanted that horse, they wanted that gun, they wanted that, the, that money, the boots. You know, think about all of the supplies that they would have gotten for free, um, you know, had uh, either side really lived up to their promises. And I have read on um, both occasions that not everybody got everything they were promised. And then those who could decided, Adam, I'm, I'm out of here. We're not going to stay. I'll just go back over into Mexico and go to my family there and, you know, come back when, when times get a little bit more quiet. So, go ahead. U.S. color troops is another subject matter um, that we talk about in this, uh, in this project. And it's a pretty big part of the project. Um, 
We have uh, the USCI, USCT, meaning US Colored Troops or US Colored Infantry that fought down here. They did fight at the last land battle of the Civil War, the 62nd, the 84th. Um, they were in segregated camps outside of, uh, you know, uh, outside of Brazo Santiago Island as, as you're coming toward Brownsville. Um, and so we, we show the different, some of the different soldiers that were here. Um, and then um, one of the things that has struck um, with Dr. Skronik and a friend of his who was very instrumental in helping us develop this trail initially uh, was um, a person named uh, Stephen McBride who is the lead archeologist and um, man in charge of uh, Camp Nelson out of Kentucky. And those US color troops who mustered in with him in Kentucky were sent down here. The 114th, 116th, 117th units um, of US colored infantry. So they served down here. And so he was like a kid in a candy store when he came down to visit us one time. Uh, very who impressed. Were, who, who were their officers, black or white? White, yeah. One of them is buried, uh, I think the last name is Kelly, buried in the Old City Cemetery in Brownsville. Um, anyway, um, so we have these troops coming down from Kentucky, uh, defending uh, the border after the Civil War and rebuilding those, uh, those um, uh, military forts, Fort Brown, Ringgold Barracks, and then uh, Fort McIntosh and Laredo, and then all the way up, all the way up the border as well. Uh, and those U.S. color troops um, evolved into what we know today as um, Buffalo Soldiers as well, uh, into the 1870s and the 1880s when they were um, defending the border um, for other types of Native American incursions and things like that. So, um, Steve McBride was incredibly impressed with Fort Ringgold in Rio Grande City, saying that it is the best preserved um, American military fort from the 19 or from the 1800s uh, that's left in this country. So that was one of the reasons why we really felt it was important to. Um, start this project and preserve it and other places along the Rio Grande uh, that had to do with the U.S. Civil War um, because, you know, we are, we are a region that's, you know, vastly ignored, especially uh, with Civil War historians. Um, Ken Burns and his big documentary series about the U.S. Civil War never once mentions any activity down here. And if you read a Civil War history book, maybe at the end you might see a little blurb, a little paragraph about that last land battle at Palmito Ranch or Palmito Hill. So we, in an effort to um, bring this history to life and to show the importance of this region, uh, during that period of time, especially considering the fact that had the United States government been able to successfully blockade the Confederacy, the war would have ended sooner and a lot of lives would have been saved. Next. Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. How much fighting was there here? You say people were engaged in fighting. We have, um, well, in our um, battles, uh, triptych, you'll see we have uh, four different battles that occurred. Um, along, um, along the river, the, there were two at Clareno, one at Soledad Ranch in Zapata County. There was one at San Augustine uh, Plaza in Laredo, uh, another one at Zacate Creek in Laredo, uh, and then of course um, the one at Palmito Ranch down in outside of Brownsville. So throughout the Civil War, there were, there were battles and skirmishes down here. Um, and then if you were to, can you go back a couple slides? When you come visit us, as you're gonna heart, you're not gonna be able to see, keep going, keep going, oh, stop, okay. This, this map here shows all the different ones. 
Okay. Are you talking hundreds of troops involved or dozens or, I mean, you know, battles and skirmishes? Yeah, no, hundreds. hundreds. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And is that documented in a book? Mm hmm. Yeah, I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> okay, so in the visitor center at UTRGV, when you come to visit uh, and, and, and take a look at our uh, exhibit, uh, we have, there's a little theater inside the visitor center, and we have two nine, nine to ten minute films uh, that we are running uh, continuously on a loop. So basically, roughly every 20 minutes, it repeats itself. Um, you know, uh, one is about cotton times that talks about the industry um, of the cotton industry and all of the money that uh, was made down here during that particular time. Um, and the, like, for example, um, did you know, and I'm not going to get to this one, so, because I see it's getting close, but did you know that the Confederacy earned or sold $162 million worth of cotton during those four years? to help fund their cause, $162 million of income. When they started, the Confederacy had in their, in their treasury about 57, it was 47 or $57 million. And at that time, in 1861, that treasury and the Confederacy, or the CSA, the Confederate States of America, was considered the fifth wealthiest country at the time. So had all of that trade stopped or been blockaded, that $162 million would not have, you can see, it was a big chunk of, you know, keeping them going. That particular number, $162 million, and don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, Dr. Levinson quoted this in, in the film. It's, it's about, in today's money, $2.9 billion. Was yes. it mostly sold to the British? Uh, British and, and the Northern United States. <laughs> <laughs> and other countries, yes. Not just Great Britain. It was multiple countries waiting. Yes. Uh, have you run across the black and white ball in San Antonio? It, uh, mm -mm. it still exists. It's an annual event. And it was started by Los Algodones, you know, the people who were making money from cotton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, these are, are families with old money in San Antonio, and yep. the old money came from the <coughs> cotton trade. Yeah. Well, um, the Cotton Times is also referred to as Los Algodones down, down here, you know, because there was a lot of cotton. And it was coming from Louisiana and East Texas and Arkansas and coming down in wagons and being traded and, and sold at Brownsville, Matamoros, out to Baghdad and then out to the, out to the, um, um, all of those ships that were waiting to purchase it. Uh, and then a letter from Roma is, uh, has to do with uh, U.S. color troops. That's a film that has to do with some um, um, folks who were uh, from Kentucky, from that Camp Nelson place, where they were down here. And we have a letter that was written back home from Roma uh, by a, uh, a black sergeant I, I think he was in the 116th um, and was uh, sent back home. And he talks about what life was like, how the people there were very nice to them. If we stay much longer, we'll all be speaking Spanish and whatnot. <laughs> so that film is there. We have a little side exhibit that shows uh, the letter and uh, his jacket and everything. Uh, so we have, a th we have a little theater. So I want to... 
Uh, that's our Veterans Memorial Wall. It has the, the Hispanic or the Tejano forces that were uh, serving down here. Uh, mostly in the Union, a lot of those names repeat between the 1st and 2nd uh, Cavalry. And then we have independent partisan rangers that were fighting for the Union. And then uh, uh, several different Confederate forces, one of which being uh, Santos Benavides's 33rd Texas Cavalry out of, um, out of Laredo. Next. And then, um, so I'll just zip through this because I want to leave time for questions, but these are some things you'll see. We've got dressed uh, mannequins and reenactors uh, posing for um, pictures. Next. And uh, we've got a couple of um, display cases that show some items that uh, we've collected from our reenactors and then from other donors that uh, have to do with camp life and with uh, military engagements. Next. We have a kids' corner where they can actually touch cotton, either raw cotton or ginned cotton. And then this is a, a huge chunk of salt from Sol Del Rey, uh, raw salt. Uh, Dr. Skronik says when you grind it up, it's great on pizza. <laughs> uh, and then in, also in the kids' corner, we have a bunch of pictures of soldiers and other folks from the period and items that they could try on. Next. Uh, these are the uh, educational tools that we have um, that we uh, have developed travel a traveling trunk for K through 12 education with um, a lesson plan book that's aligned with the TEKS, which is the Texas Education of Knowledge and, and Standards and, uh, uh, and, a, and a book that goes with it so that the teachers know what to teach in the classroom. And then all of these items in here are, you know, the, the wide brimmed hat, the wool jackets, the accoutrements, um, the different flags that would have been flying down here. All kinds of great educational tools for the, the K through 12 teaching community. Next. Um, we've gotten a lot of media coverage lately. I can say um, I've had a little bit more than my 15 minutes of fame. Um, and I'm going to ride the wave as long as I can uh, for the sake of the CHAPS program and for the sake of this project. Uh, we've gotten a lot of um, 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 attention because two of the sites on our trail, the Jackson Ranch and the Weber Ranch, those mixed race communities I told you that had come down here before the Civil War had uh, activity on, uh, from the Underground Railroad going through their ranches using their ferry landings and, and ushering these fugitive and sla uh, escaped slaves across the river into Mexico, which at the time, Mexico had abolished slavery in 1829. So when most of those slaves from the South were moving north into um, you know, northern states like Ohio and then into Canada, we did have some that were coming this way and passed through uh, two of the sites on our trail. So I've been getting calls. I, I just, this article just came out yesterday from the Washington Post. I've been called twice by the Los Angeles Times and interviewed down here. Uh, the Monitor has run some articles. Con Mi Gente, which, which you've seen, and other KGB T and Channel 4 wants to do an interview as well. So go ahead. Uh, we launched our Ferry Ride to Free, or Just a Ferry Ride to Freedom documentary film. That's where I met uh, Mr. Vela, um, Eduardo Vela, and uh, other, other folks who are descendants of people that are on our trail. And this documentary film has to do with not just the Underground Railroad, now it passed through this region, into Mexico through sites on our trail, but it has to do with other aspects of the Rio Grande Valley uh, history. And um, so it's about an hour long documentary film. Uh, we will be showing it again at the event where I've given out the flyers for, so next. Okay, so there's that flyer you all have. Um, so if you want to come beforehand, that's fine. But on Saturday, April 6th, we are going to have an all-day extravaganza community engagement event uh, where we will have the museum exhibit open. Because right now it's only open Mondays through Fridays because that's when the building's open. 
but we're going to have this all day event so the museum exhibit will be open on uh, Monday through Friday uh, I'm sorry will be open on Saturday all day um, and then we are going to have a public lecture series with um, a lot of different speakers that have helped us develop this trail and have helped us write books about this subject. Um, uh, we have Mr. John now from the Civil War Trust and he is the chairman of the Texas Historical Commission coming down to launch this whole project off for us. Uh, we will do a documentary film screening that day as well. And in addition, we are going to have the reenactors uh, that we work with. We're going to have about 10 different reenactors, both Union and Confederate reenactors there. And uh, we'll have like essentially a living history area. So they'll be dressed in uniform like Ruben um, Cordova, the one I mentioned, who's a Lee Pon Apache descendant. Um, but he is a uh, son of a con or sons of Confederate veterans in that group. Uh, so his ancestor fought for the Confederacy down here and he dresses up like Co Colonel Santos Benavides. And according to Jerry Thompson, he actually looks like Colonel Santos Benavides. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so we'll have a living history event. Uh, come hungry, we'll have uh, breakfast items and lunch items being sold by our <coughs> anthropology club and history club students so they could make a little bit money for themselves and go on their, their summer trips. Uh, so please, you know, come hungry and, and spend a little money with them. Um, and uh, we'll also have book signings. So um, next. This is the lineup um, of, of the different speakers, which is on the back of your, um, the postcard that I gave you guys. Next. And these are the three books that we've written that have to do with the, the Civil War in the Rio Grande Valley. They will all three be on sale at the event. And then the authors, not just the three of us who were the editors, but all of the different folks who participated and wrote a chapter in this book uh, will be on hand to sign as well. So I already kind of showed you with the educational tools, the one to your right. That's the uh, popular book, more of an easy read book that goes along with the lesson plan books. Uh, we just gave 4,000 of them out to uh, seventh graders during Festiva week. So um, they, the, the Gear Up people were generous enough to buy that book and give one out to every student that came. So, um, and then a lot of our uh, history professors actually use that book in the history 1301 class because at the end of that class they cover the Civil War. The one in the middle is our um, tourism guidebook. So this is where you want to drive the 200 mile trail and you know while you're driving and your passenger is reading the book <laughs> you they can say hey we're close to so and so and such and such we're we're close to you know Fort Fort Ringgold we're close to Battle at Zacate Creek we're we're close to Jackson Ranch so you want to uh, it's a it's a lots of pictures in that book uh, we don't have a lot of pictures from that period of time, but we have a, you know, old pictures in there, what it looks like today. And it's a guidebook in the sense where it'll tell you uh, a little bit of history about each of the counties you're going to be driving through and other different places that you could go to, like um, other museums, birding centers, things, you know, phone numbers that you can contact for these other tourist places and maybe their hours of operation, things like that. Um, and then this book is our heavy scholarly anthology uh, where 11 of us wrote a chapter in this book that had to do with our different expertise that has to do with the Civil War. So you've got one about um, um, Civil War generals who served as lieutenants in the Mexican-American War together down here but who ended up fighting separately or against each other in the US Civil War as they they were promoted to generals. We have one about Tejanos in the military. Um, Life lived along the Rio Grande, all the economic stuff. Mary Margaret McCallan wrote that one. Jerry Thompson wrote the one about Tejanos in the military. We have battlefield archaeology, um, 
We have all kinds of different subject matters that have to do uh, with uh, the Civil War events uh, that occurred down here in the Rio Grande Valley. So they'll be on sale uh, at, the, uh, at the event and we'll be on hand to sign them. Next. Also, we have a special numbered series of sketches. Um, the artists that we uh, use to develop this whole project um, of all the, the five triptych different subject matters that are in, in, the, in the exhibit, each one of them has a special hand-drawn sketch in there. So we are printing them out in, in not quite lithograph form, but almost lithograph form. And he will sign them and number them. So we are going to have a special sale going on. And we haven't decided yet if we're going to do it as an auction or just sell them in numbers. But, you know, we'll have that special item there. And next. So I really would love to see you all come on April the 6th. Uh, spend the day with us. You know, you don't have to sit and listen to every single solitary um, lecture. We're all each going to give uh, 15 minutes <laughs> of our specific uh, expertise. I'm going to have a problem with that because I can't <laughs> seem to stop talking. <laughs> but by then, I will have practiced and timed myself. I promise. And so, uh, but you know, it'll be, you can come and you can sit and listen to some of the lectures. You can go walk around the living history area. You can go through the museum, see our films, end the day by watching our documentary film, spend some money with our students who would like to go on their summer trips, uh, you know, on archeological digs and other, other historical things. And, um, you know, learn a little bit more about your region's history. Yes, sir. Where should we park on, on April 6th? Anywhere. <laughs> this is the Pan Am campus, right? Yes, yes, but they you want... really obnoxious to anybody yeah. who, is not, who does not have a pass or is not a... No, well, it'll be Saturday. It'll be Saturday. And they know it's an event occurring. So we have, right in front of the visitor center, there's a, a, a visitor's parking mm -hmm. lot. Um, but, you know, most of the students and the faculty will not be there and uh, we will be, um, I, you know, I'm in communication with every time we have an event there, I'm in communication with the police department and the parking people and they will not be giving out tickets. If you get a ticket, you bring it to me. I will take care of it. I don't mean I'm going to pay for it, I mean I'm going to make, I'm going to, I'm going to make them I'm going to make it, uh, I'm going to make them disappear. Yeah, yeah. So, but there's, uh, on our, uh, we have different parking lots that are kind of on that southwest side corner that are close to the student union and the visitor center. Um, you know, so, yes. For those of us who are not familiar with your campus, can you go into a little more detail about where this would be? Okay. If you were to Google, the address of UTRGV, and it'll, it'll be 1201 West University Drive, and the main entrance of UTRGV takes you in pointing right at the visitor center. So what, if you were to think of UTRGV as essentially a rectangle, um, and you're standing in the south facing the north, it's where we are going to be or in the lower left quadrant. Yes. It's just a direct entrance off of Highway 107. Just yes. Left turn across Highway 107, you're there. Yes, yes. Into the, you'll see um, an information kiosk there. And then there's that Bronx statue right next to the visitor center. I'm going to have a bunch of balloons or something outside of the visitor center. Plus, we're going to have a 10 foot by 10 foot banner on the outside of the visitor center. So if you were to start there, we'll have students. We're running a class this semester about museum studies and curator uh, issues and being a docent and whatnot. So we have about a dozen students in our class who I'm hoping through the costume department I will be able to get dressed in period wear and who will be able to guide uh, people back and forth uh, throughout, throughout the day. So the visitor center 
and just a little bit north and to the west of the visitor center, literally the next building back is the student union. And in the student union uh, lobby, before you get into the student union theater where we'll have the lecture series, uh, we are gonna have regional, not just local, regional tourism and museum folks. So we're gonna have people from the King Ranch, we're gonna have people from the Kennedy Ranch, we're going to have people from the Texas Historical Commission, uh, Texas Tro Tropical Trails. We'll have people from Revive Fort Ringgold, uh, Museum of South Texas History, National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, a bunch of different folks who will be uh, in the lobby of the Student Union with their own tables and brochures and, and information, tourism information to give out. So they'll be there to answer any questions that you have. Yes, sir. Have you all been able to gather any written material from those families? Mm -hmm. Letters or well, diaries or logs? Or yeah. Um, what I have right now are a few reports that were written. Um, one was written in, in the 80s, and the other one was written early in, like, let's say 2004. So, you know, 14, 15 years ago. Um, and I have census data, you know, it, it, the census anybody can get. Um, and just the other day, I had a, a woman come to see me in my office who is in possession of documents and pictures and other reports of the Jackson family. Um, and so literally Thursday, she came to see me in the office. And so we are going to spend some time together in the next, hopefully. She's a teacher, so she doesn't have a lot of time free until the summer. Um, but I'm very anxious to see what she has. So um, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. But with regard to the, with regard to the Jackson family, with regard to the Weber family, um, there's no letters and, and things like that per se. But early on where John Ferdinand Weber was part of Austin's uh, 300 and had his own little grant of land in what we know today as Weberville, which is outside of Austin. It's got a population of about 500 people right now. It's very small on the Colorado River. Um, there are, um, there are um, not, not so much documents, but some information that you can find in the annals of um, Travis County history. There's a book out there called, um, um, it's by Noah Smithwick, and it's, um, it's called Ev Evolution of a State that specifically talks about that particular couple and how they functioned in society up there before they felt like they had to leave uh, when the Fugitive Slave Act came into play in 1850. Uh, and, you know, and then you also had the Dred Scott um, decision uh, in the 1850s as well. Um, so uh, I'm looking, I'm still looking. So I can, um, I, I, I've rolled up my sleeves quite a bit and gotten some stuff, but not as much as I would like to. So I'm still looking. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a friend asking if there's any legends about lost gold, Confederate gold, in the valley. <laughs> I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. I don't know anything about that. I haven't even, I haven't even gone there. I'm still going toward the non-legend stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, things, things come out of the woodwork all the time, you know. So, but we'll, we'll look into that when, you know, in, in our copious amounts of spare time, <laughs> we'll take a look at that. So, go, go ahead, sir. Anybody else have any other questions? I want to thank you for coming. Oh. Most of the <laughs> Most of what I know about your topic, I learned from hiding under the table when I was a child, uh -huh. listening to the older people in my family discussing oral family history. Mm -hmm. wow. And I would so much like to know some, 
some more. Mm -hmm. My mom was born in 1918. Her mother was raised down here and was the daughter of a Confederate soldier. And the family, by oral history, came from Alabama when uh, Jackson was president. Okay. <laughs> and so they, different parts of the family have been here for a very long time. And I wish I knew more, but every time I got found, I got kicked out. Aww. I don't know anything. Uh -huh. <laughs> I wish I knew. It's too bad you weren't down there with a tape recorder. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I was raised down here in, uh, close to Raymondsville, and we used to go every couple of weeks to uh, uh, the Salt Lake mm -hmm. to dig for ice cream salt. That's what we used it for. Wow. So I had a lot of good ice cream. Interesting. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I gave a, I gave a talk up there. We, they had this uh, Rio Reforestation Day back in um, sometime in October or November. And uh, um, I went out there and I, I, I gave my students extra credit to go for the day. And I don't think they realized what they were getting into with the, with the shovels and the, the planting trees and everything. But, but yes, and when we all went out to the lake, it's pretty... It's pretty neat. Like right now, it's it has a lot of water in it, so you don't see that, you know, the crusty salt so much. Um, but yes, it's it's a an extremely valuable area that's been utilized for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, when Fort Ringle is going to have their ROTC show, like a, it's not a reenactment, but it's a parade parade ground. I, I don't know. I could ask Colonel Barrera um, after, afterwards, see if he knows. But he'll be here. Uh, he'll be at our April 6th event uh, with a table to uh, promote the Revive Fort Ringgold effort over there. So, yeah. Anybody else have any other questions? Yes? I had heard that uh, the forts were 100 miles apart. They are. Yeah. To protect us from the, yes. the, the border, protect the border. Yeah, and well, you know, you think about 100 miles is a pretty vast distance, you know. And what I, what I, <laughs> on foot, yes, or on horseback even. And so, yes, Fort Brown, Fort Ringgold, Fort McIntosh, they're all about 100 miles away <laughs> from each other. Um, and, and, you know, that's, one of the things that I talk about when I mention those mixed race families who came to the Rio Grande Valley in um, 1850s, Weber's in 1851, 52, and the Jacksons in 1857, um, why did they pick Hidalgo? Or why did they pick Hidalgo County or, you know, the, or close to the, hit, uh, the county seat? Because the Jackson Ranch is at the, today, you'd find it at the tippy bottom of I Road or what is now called Veterans Road, uh, that, which is the border between uh, Far and San Juan. And then at the bottom of Alamo Road, where the Krenmuller farm is right now, is where the Weber Ranch was. And uh, they have a cemetery there. The Jacksons have a couple cemeteries over there. Um, and you kind of wonder why, why would they pick it? Hidalgo mm -hmm. County had become this, the, or the county seat for Hidalgo County had become, um, uh, established in what was then called Edinburgh, is now called Hidalgo, uh, in 1852. And it's, where is that? It's right in the middle of Fort Brown and Fort Ringgold. So like, for example, John Klossner, when he came in the 1880s, and he ended up becoming the, the Hidalgo County Sheriff eventually, he was running um, mail uh, uh, between the two forts, and he chose that San Juan Plantation, which is essentially the Jackson Ranch property, because it was exactly in between the two forts. And it was easy access for him, or at least, you know, halfway between two major points. So I'm guessing, or I'm surmising, or theorizing that those folks who came um, those mixed race families who came in the 1850s chose that area because they wanted to live quietly and in peace and not be um, judged and bothered by anybody because of their um, marital status of, you know, a white man and a black woman and their mixed race children. Um, 
but also it's pretty close to two forts in the sense where the military is going to be going up and down. You know, there was a little bit of security there at the time. So they could go to a secure area, yet be on their own and, and, and just live in peace and harmony, not be bothered by too many people. So that's... I think it's interesting to point out that a lot of the descendants of those families uh, became totally merged in the Hispanic with the Mexican uh, Yes, and absolutely. And in large, in a lot of our communities, that their descendants are almost considered Mexican. Well, well they are. That's their identity now. Identity. Absolutely. I, I interviewed a, a Jackson descendant um, a couple years ago when we were getting ready to write those books and um, his last name is Jackson. Uh, he's probably around my age and he told me that when he went off to college in uh, what was then uh, UTSA in San Antonio and he left from the valley uh, and he went up there, he had never been out of the valley before, he was telling his classmates that Jackson was a Mexican last name. <laughs> And, and sincere in his, his co because he grew up speaking Spanish first and, and that's the way they assimilated into the community so much so that as, you know, as the generations went on, that was, that's their true identity. That's how they, they um, refer to themselves, you know, so, yes? Have you considered that those mixed race families may have been winter Texans who came, <laughs> who came here for the weather? Well, could have been, could have been. You know, the Webbers came from the Austin area. Uh, the Jacksons came with, um, I want to say, seven different families and five covered wagons out of Alabama. Um, and both say that they were on their way to Mexico. Um, and Weber was definitely adept in traveling that Nueces Strip between, you know, what we know today is the Nueces River and the, and the Rio Grande, uh, but definitely out of um, Austin and trading tobacco and other wares, you know. He knew of <coughs> life in Mexico. He, he'd been back and forth so many times. The Jacksons were coming, and I don't know this for sure because I don't have letters or I don't have any data to, to uh, refer to, but within that same year, there was a colony in Mexico that they, the Mexican government was trying to establish with 100 black families, and they were appealing or making an appeal to escaped or fugitive slaves to go to Mexico near Tampico and establish this community called Eureka, and it was in 1857. So you kind of got to wonder, why is this, this family taking, you know, five covered wagons, seven families, a dozen emancipated slaves, you know, they're, they're worried for their lives and livelihood because of the Fugitive Slave Act, because of the Dred Scott decision. And they're thinking, we got to get out of here. We got to go somewhere else because this is not going to work for a long period of time. Um, you know, but they didn't actually go all the way over the border into Mexico. They stopped. And they, you could, you could guess that they said to themselves, hmm, well, we, we're Americans, we speak English in Mexico, they speak Spanish. And the, that particular, the Jacksons in particular, were Methodists. And we all know that the Catholicism is, is uh, the main religion in Mexico. So they probably thought, eh, I think we'll just stay here. If we have to go across a river, we've got our ferry landing at the ranch, and we can just zip over the river. And they, they, they managed to do that um, and just to, and stay there. And they did assist other slaves or other fugitive slaves who passed through and knew of, of their colony. Um, and some of them decided to stay with them and not go all the way into Mexico. So, yes. Anything else? Maybe that was the original green book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like to refer to um, um, a movie called 12 Years a Slave when I talk about that Fugitive Slave Act. And just so I can, I can have the audience envision exactly what could have happened to these people had they not left where they were, 
um, and and found their refuge down along the river here. You know that slave in the in twelve years a slave was. Um, a freed man, legally freed man, and very highly educated and very talented, and he was duped into thinking he was going to be hired for some special event, so he left uh, where he was in, I want to say, Boston area, New England, and went down to closer to, um, I don't know if it was Washington, D.C. I just, it's been a long time since I've seen the movie, but he went somewhere closer to the south, and that person tricked him and then captured him and sold him into slavery. <coughs> so these things were happening and folks who were um, in these situations already freed. And then of course, you know, in the slavery uh, society, uh, a child of a slave, even though the, 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 let's say the father's white and the mother's black and, and, and is a black slave, that child is considered a slave. So, you know, imagine Nathaniel Jackson and his wife, Matilda Hicks, and their seven mixed race children and her three mixed race children from a previous man, you know, uh, that's a big family there that has to worry about everybody except the white father. So. You did a really good job. You've only been this in a short time. How long has it been now that you started this project? This, uh, the Civil War Trail Project, we started it in 2013. Yeah, yeah, so um, I've learned so much, <laughs> really. And I don't call myself an expert in anything, honestly, but um, it's been, and I really try to say when I think of something as my opinion or I'm theorizing something, you know, it's, there's a definite difference between things that you've found and things that, you know, you can only, imagine. Um, but our goal really is to um, talk about the Rio Grande Valley and how interesting and intriguing and historically significant this place really is, you know, because we have, uh, and especially in today's climate where we have a little, uh, you know, the media attention that we get sometimes is not very positive. Um, we need to show a good frontier. Uh, and not just a front, it's like this is a, an interesting place. The, it's warm and sunny every day, which makes for very nice people. I think you all can attest to that, right? Otherwise you wouldn't be here, whether you were born and raised here or you're visiting for six months out of the year. You know, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very cool place. Yes? Is there a plan to find a permanent home for the exhibit once its run ends at the college? Well, it's a traveling exhibit right now. So uh, we have already uh, interest through the middle of 2020. So it's gonna stand at UTRGV until Juneteenth, which is um, June 19th. There's Edinburgh every year has a Juneteenth observation with regard to the <coughs> freeing of slaves in Texas. So it'll stand through there because we have our US color troops as a, as a big part of the exhibit. After that, it's going to go to the Port Isabel Museum um, for July and August, and then, or end of June through the end of August. Then at the end of August, in <coughs> September and October, it's going to the Zapata County Historical Museum. And then in November and December, it's going to go to UTRGV in Brownsville. And then in January of 2020, <coughs> it's going to the Webb County Historical Foundation in, on, uh, on the square, San Augustine Square in Laredo. And then from April through June, it's gonna go to U, uh, Texas A&M International University's Special Collections Archives uh, from April, May, and June. And then probably before the middle of June, it's gonna go to, uh, we're already, as a matter of fact, in about a half an hour, Dr. Skronik's gonna be meeting with somebody out of Corpus Christi who wants to have the exhibit after that. So right now, we are excited about people wanting to have it in their collection. And then once um, that, like I said, we're riding that wave of our more than 15 minutes of fame. So we are, we're getting a lot of positive attention. And so once that dies down, yes, we'll consider thinking about a, a permanent place for it. But right now, 
we're just like, okay, you want it too? Okay, well, <laughs> all right, they, okay, you're gonna have to wait now. And you know, even the Witty Museum in um, in uh, San Antonio, I've I've sent it up there, um, and uh, I mean, I've sent the information about it up there, and I'm hoping that um, they're gonna have some interest in it too, because I wanted to put it in the Texan cultures um, that, but I I've heard that's closing. I don't know when, but I hear it's closing. <laughs> uh, tex it's UTSA's Texan Cultures uh, thing. So, full, yeah, yeah, yeah. Institute. That's right. Institute of Texas Cultures. So, yeah, we'll we'll be looking for a permanent place. But I did meet um, a, a Jackson family member uh, just the other day, uh, who told me she has documents. She has cattle brands. She has um, photos, she has uh, deeds, she has lots of stuff that she's been, I would, you know, hiding for, for years, but it's just that nobody's, we, we just haven't crossed paths and, and uh, you know, she, she just felt very sentimental about all the items and then she just finally felt comfortable in coming to see somebody who was interested in what she had. So she's expressed to me, and I hope she doesn't get mad at me for saying this, but she says she has a little piece of property in FAR that um, she might like to put a little museum because she's got a lot of stuff to put in it. And I mean, we love to hear things like that because uh, we do need those cultural museum centers. Part of what the CHAPS program is all about is about bringing tourism into the region. And you know, every time we talk with somebody from a uh, economic development corporation or from a uh, chamber of commerce, they want those heads in beds. You know, you've seen all those big hotels that they they need them filled. So when the birds and the butterflies are asleep, or it's or it's too cold to come out, you have something to do by driving the trail. You know, so.